Good evening and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Rashmita and I'm the event planner for Microsoft Reactor Bengaluru, India. This session will run over the next 60 minutes, including Q&A. The session is being recorded and will be uploaded to our Reactor YouTube channel. I will share the link to our YouTube channel in the chat section soon. Before we begin, please take a moment to read our code of conduct. We are all here to learn together, so please be respectful of other people's views, understanding of differences, being kind and considerate in the way you engage. The chat will be open throughout and we do encourage you all to participate. Also, please keep your mics muted during the session. I would now like to welcome Shivam, our speaker for today's session. Shivam is an author, cloud architect, speaker, and co-founder at TechScalable. He is passionate about technology and works on Azure, GCP, machine learning, and blockchain. He is also a Microsoft certified trainer. But for now, I will hand over to Shivam to begin the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rashmita. I will just quickly share my screen. OK, just give me one second, guys. OK, good evening, everyone. Hopefully all of you are doing well. All of you are safe. You are uh, at home. And uh, today we are going to discuss about the computer vision along with Azure Machine Learning Service. How can you deploy? How can you solve computer vision problems using? PyTorch on Azure ML. That's the agenda for the day. And if I just walk you through the details of the the learn modules which we have over here. I'll just click on it. And check this out. So after the session, this is the learn module for the day which we can go and complete. Now in this learn module uh, to complete this, you can log in from using any of your uh, personal email ID over there and then you can simply go and complete the task. Uh, and if I just walk you through the modules over there or the units which we have over here. And if I click on the first unit, you will notice that even a sandbox is provided for you to complete your learn module. So you don't even need Azure subscription to complete this uh, post uh, session uh, module over there and you can simply activate the sandbox and you just have to log in for that and once you have done it you will be able to uh, do the the complete the learn module now whatever we are going to discuss will be there and even more even way more things will be there which may we may not have time to discuss today OK, so we will be going through classification classification plus localization object detection image uh, uh, instance segmentation over there and what are tensors as such. So if you are coming from the previous session which I have done last week, uh, we already completed the tensor part like basics of. Uh, the, the basics of PyTorch. What is the mean? What's the meaning of data set data loader? What is the meaning of uh, how do you create the basic? Uh, uh, how do you design the how do you create the neural network class over there and all those basics have been covered. We'll see them. And but we'll build further on top of it today itself. Uh, I'll share the link in the chat. Uh, if you have questions, you can ask the questions in the chat. I have the chat open with me on the secondary screen and I will take those questions on the way. Otherwise, uh, I'll take the questions in the end of it. Right. OK, so apart from this, uh, if I just click on the next unit over there, uh, we also will be discussing about the uh, the neural networks as such. What is the meaning of simple neural networks and what are then uh, multi layer neural networks? So uh, actually this is something which we did in the last session itself, the, the simple neural network over there. And uh, uh, we were going through these things uh, as such. The what is data loader? What's the meaning of data set? I'll walk you through them. However, you can also have a better look at them using the, the links which are there in the chat. Now if I just show you what else is there uh, here, we have multi-layer perceptron as well. OK, so we have the multi-layer perceptron as well over here, and this is where uh, the things go. Uh, 
deep over there. So you can see we have input layers and output layers are there and then uh, and you, you add hidden layers over there and uh, your network is becoming deeper and deeper and more complicated to train as well and more complicated to optimize also. OK, so today we are going to see the uh, we are focusing on the convolutional neural network. Convolutional neural network is the is one of the architecture which is the most popular one or which has made the uh, which has made uh, deep learning mainstream. So this is something which we'll we'll see. We'll understand what is the meaning of it. How do you uh, what are the various type of uh, filters as such? What, are, what is the meaning of convolutional layer over there? Input channel, output channel, kernel size. What's a filter? Should we go for three cross three, five cross five, eleven cross eleven? Or uh, how do you create the uh, the this is the class of the neural network which we were talking about, and so on and so forth. Okay, so I will just move it onto one side and I will bring in the images and the reference whenever required. Now this is something which we'll be deploying in uh, uh, in half an hour, so we'll see what that is later on. But uh, for the first time, I have one PPT also uh, prepared for you, and this PPT is something which will help us in understanding the the various bits and pieces of convolutional neural network. And we will once we have understood those elements, uh, then we will see the deployment of it using PyTorch on, on Azure Machine Learning Service. We'll have a walk walkthrough of the Azure Machine Learning Service as well. What was the, uh, the different uh, we can say the components or the elements of the SDK which you should be aware of. OK, so I won't take much time on this slide. Basically, uh, machine learning is a subset of AI where you practically deploy it or you practically make things uh, artificially intelligent and deep learning is the subset of uh, machine learning where we where the architecture tries to mimic the human brain or the human uh, the 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 neuron structure which we have in the human brain. So that is where your deep learning goes. Now. Today we are going to focus on the the CNNs as such convolutional. Uh, the convo convolutional neural networks over here, and this is how on a very high level. This is how they look like we have input images. We have convolutions. We have pooling layers. We have fully connected layers and and so on and so forth. So uh, the CNNs are the ones which are you can say they, these are the neural networks which have made the deep learning mainstream and they are the ones uh, you can say they have a huge number of benefits you can uh, you can basically use uh, convolutional neural networks for image classification you can do it for dis disease diagnostics as such you can use it for uh, uh, object tracking over there you can use it for uh, OCR as well optical character recognition and you can also use it for the semantic segmentation of the images over there they have applications in robotics they have applications in the in the autonomous driving cars they have applications in the in the uh, in the land usage analysis or if there is a disaster then after the disaster you can also scan the 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 damage from air itself itself so how can you uh, so they have applications and variations which cover all these things. OK, now so whenever we work with the image uh, or whenever we work with the visual or whenever we work with the with the vision uh, problems, there are many problems which happens over there. And the problems will be like that viewpoint variation may be there. So for example, uh, you may have the same image, you may have trained your uh, models to learn on the same image, but uh, but the orientation of the image was different. So because of that classification is not working properly and so on and so forth. Lighting conditions also create a lot of issues as such. Uh, if the scale variation over there, if you are zoomed in versus zoomed out, then also that's another issue which you have to handle. Deformation of the of the uh, objects over there. If you can see this cat pretty deformed right now. Uh, if if part of your face is not detected, then even your cell phone doesn't unlock the screen, right? And you are supposed to either uh, properly look in the screen or camera, or you have to enter the uh, the pin code manually, right? All those things needs to be done. So that is basically when you uh, when your face is not fully visible. Background uh, clutter is also another problem, and intra class variations may be huge, and because of these, uh, 
I can say that the the image processing or image oriented problems are difficult to solve. Now, OK, let's focus on convolutional neural network today, right? So the convolutional neural networks are biologically inspired. So we have Professor David Hubel and uh, Torstein uh, and they were doing the. Uh, they were researching with the re on the retina of the dead cat in 1950s and 1960s as such, and their uh, their research was groundbreaking at that point in time, and they even received the Nobel Prize uh, in 1981 for their discoveries which they have done. So uh, they actually were working on. Uh, so they they uh, you can say in in a nutshell, basically the they used to shine the light on the retina of the uh, cat and there were some uh, electrodes or which were there in the which was embedded in the brain of the cat and the cat was obviously uh, obviously dead uh, and then because of that various type of neurons used to fire various type of activities were noticed in the human in in the brain of the cat so today today you you must be aware of that we have uh, uh, rods and cones in the retina but in 1950s and 1960s, uh, when uh, when the research was being done, three type of neurons were detected. So during that uh, experiment, they found that we have center surround cells, simple cells, and complex cells. Three type of cells are there in the in the brain. Now the center sur surround cells were the ones where if you shine light at the center of it, then they trigger, they activate, and if you shine the light on the entire region, then they do not uh, trigger as such and uh, uh, then uh, the combinations of uh, these center surround cells were called as the simple cells over there and if you shine the light in some particular orientation then these cells used to trigger over there so you can say there was some orientation of light right now now apart from this uh, even the complex cells were discovered these complex cells was, were the ones when you uh, when you shine the light and you show the motion of it right when you move the light light around then these type of cells were getting triggered so one thing which was understood by the uh, by the researchers at that point in time was that the human brain or the or the brain of the cat or the uh, or the visual system of uh, or the visual system is very complicated and it basically has multiple different type of neurons which gather various information from the input uh, light or uh, image as such like some of them are able to detect the uh, the lines some of them are able to detect the motion and so on and so forth so this is the inspiration behind convolutional neural network and convolutional neural network is 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 on a very high level can be represented by something which i have the in the screen right now So you can see that the various uh, the, the pictures are going uh, and there are various layers and then finally the output came either this is of this class or some other class over there. Now uh, OK, now if we go in depth uh, in this architecture, this is how basically it may be looking like. So if I click on it, OK, so you can see we have these uh, convolutional layers over there, then pooling layers are there, then convolutional layers are there, then pooling layers are there. And, and so on and so forth. These are stacked, and uh, and this is uh, how the uh, how any pure CNN may look like. So I'm pretty sure you are aware of this uh, particular data set, and uh, there was a challenge which was held at uh, between 2010 to 2017. The challenge was called as large scale visual recognition challenge, and basically this was the data set. ImageNet was the data set which was used. It used to have. Uh, 1 million images and 1000 classes. So various uh, uh, because of this image net competition, various uh, various innovations which we are aware of, which we are which we have today uh, came into existence as such. We can we can put it like that. Now if I, I have a couple of uh, graphs over here, so this is actually uh, the, the, the this particular uh, graph is actually flipped right now. So the left hand side is the is the new one. So you can see that the 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 error has been reduced by has been reduced to 3.57 and in the recent architectures is even further reduced so a human being basically have an error rate of five percent so if i give you 100 pictures to classify then you are supposed to make five 
first five uh, error, you can say five of them will be misclassified by you somewhere around five percent error is there now so these models which we have these architectures which we have have already surpassed uh, human beings that even better than human beings uh, uh, today in various type of tasks which they are doing now one of the pure convolutional neural network which uh, which exists or which was you know it was which was developed or you can say which was uh, created is called as VGG16. This is one of the purest one. This is the one which is having the which is don't which doesn't have any other further variation on top of it. Like there were so many further variations which were created later on, and they definitely worked uh, better as well in scenarios. But this is one of the original one, and if you can see that it is having various type of uh, things the components over there. Let's say input image, convolutional layers are there, then pooling layers are there, then more convolutional layer pooling layers, and and so and so forth like this over there. And then we basically have 1000 classes over there. So dog, cat and all those various classes are there. OK, now notice notice these things over here. You see this uh, three. That's basically the the channel RGB of the input image. And uh, if you see over here, we have the feature maps. So the finally uh, 404096 features are extracted from every image. And so you can say that whatever images were, were passed through it uh, from there, 40 uh, 96 features were finally understood by the by the model by this architecture okay now so to understand this we will first we will understand the various layers which are there so i have these layers well defined over here we'll go through the convolution the meaning of what is the meaning of convolution what is pooling what is feature maps as such and uh, we will also see what is the meaning of uh, the activation which can happen over there and uh, I'll just walk you through some of the basic things which you are already aware of. Like uh, this is how any binary image will be looking like. So if I show you how any uh, color image will be looking like, which is having three channels, will be something like this. It is having the RGB channels over there. You can represent it like this R, red, uh, green, and blue as such. And uh, it has various pixel intensities over there. Now, if you work with the grayscale image, then you will basically have these intensities. Uh, uh, and this is how the representation of the grayscale image will be like. OK, so now uh, coming back to what is convolution, what is pooling and what is feature maps over there? Uh, the very first thing is convolution. So this is the uh, this is the main idea behind the behind the CNN architecture. And uh, we have the filters and these filters are uh, these filters uh, you if you uh, do photography basically you also understand the filters you ha ha have you have various type of filters by which you can uh, get many effects on the image as such so these are similar similar to that now for example over here if you can see that that is the filter the, the middle one over here three cross three uh, it is uh, moving around the 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 input image right now and we are getting the output feature map so this is that one convolution will be doing this as such. And you can see it has rotated or it has filtered or it has convolved on the entire input image. Now, why is this so important? What's the logic behind it? Uh, by having different type of filters, you will be able to detect uh, various features from the images. You can figure out the, the, the edges, the lines, texture, pattern, the part of the object, the entire object itself. So here we are, we have this filter which is moving around and it is able to find the, the, the vertical edge over there. So uh, like that. Now similarly, there are other filters also horizontal filters which can find the horizontal uh, edges. We have different filters which can find both horizontal and vertical edges at the same time over there. Now the uh, there are a couple of more uh, terms or uh, or vocabulary which you should be aware of. One is one is called a stride. So stride is basically if I'm moving the the filter on top of the the filter or the kernel. You see the, the yellow part right now. So we are calling that as the the filter or the kernel. So if you are moving that around the, uh, the the input image or input feature map right now. So if you are moving it by one unit, then it is having one stride. If you are moving it by two units, then we have have two strides over there. Now there is also another concept called as padding. Now because you must have realized that the output image is always uh, you can say reduced in size than the input one. So if you have a very big big uh, if your task is pretty complicated right now. Uh, and you and and because of the shrinking nature of the of the architecture, if uh, you do not do padding, then you may not be able to have enough number of uh, convolutions, or in you may not be able to extract enough features out of the data to be able to do the task properly. So 
uh, or secondly your uh, uh, your kernel may spill over the uh, you can say the the input feature map right now so you can see that if i don't put the zero over there the the, the kernel is basically going uh, spilling over the image over there so padding is some so here we have done zero padding on all the four sides now when you have uh, rgb color this is how the convolutions will be looking like now the, the 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 kernel which is there is also having three channels based on the input feature map and when it when the convolutions basically happen the the final output is going in the output feature map over there so this is something which we would also be uh, doing now in the convolutional neural network the main idea behind the training is that if we can learn the so you must realize that filters are very important these filters are the ones which are doing uh, the heavy lifting the filters are the ones which are doing the uh, which are doing a lot of things over there so if we can learn the filter weights itself on your input data set then uh, then we will be able to solve the the problem statement so the filter weights will be learned during the the model training itself now there are a couple of more uh, terms which you should be aware of like we have relu as such now we will be using relu today and uh, in relu we will be so this is what it does basically all the negative numbers which are there will be converted into the the output will be zero over there you can think it through like uh, it is sort of uh, if if any feature is not having uh, the the in intensity of the feature is not very very high it will simply simply sort of suppress that now apart from this couple of more things which you should be aware of is like what's the meaning of max pooling now today we will also be doing max pooling uh, and uh, max pooling if you can see over here we have this two by two uh, max pooling uh, kernel which is there and it is just moving around the the input feature map right now and uh, you can see the it's finding the 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 the, uh, the pixel with with the maximum intensity over there in the in this point in time so this is more like very similar to how it will be extracting the important features or the features which are very dominant across all the things in inside the, the 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 picture which we have or the input image which we have there is another type of pooling which is called as average pooling here the average of that particular uh, area is is in the output you can see four nine five six the average is, is six and so and so forth like that so this is the meaning of average pooling now these are various components uh, of convolutional neural networks and if i combine all of them together this is how it will be looking like now we have input images convolutions will happen we'll have the feature maps we'll do the max pooling on top of it or and then we'll get more uh, output feature maps out of it and then we will repeat the process multiple times to find more and more extract more and more features from it so various layers over there will be extracting more and more uh, textures patterns part of the object and so on and so forth from the input image and this is in a nutshell this is convolutional neural network and then later on there are so many variations of this but this is the pure convolutional neural network and you uh, you can go through the others as well so now uh, we basically uh, i'll just show you this part in the in the in the azure portal but we will be using the custom machine learning the uh, for the purpose of training our models and as you know azure is supporting uh, is provide cpu gpu cluster and is having multiple type of locations where you can store your data all those things are there and definitely we also have different tools which you can use to to train your machine learning models okay so i'll just close this slide deck and i'll just take you back to the to the azure portal and i'll tell you what we are doing today so whatever we have learned we just want to deploy that using pytorch in azure machine learning service so let me see if i can open all the correct pages once okay now have a look at this uh, the architecture which we are deploying today is called as uh, lanet over there so i will just show this to you and this is also something which you can be you will be doing uh, post the session also right using the link which is there in the chat window so the lanet architecture is basically over here this is what we are deploying the one which i am showing is slightly having slight variation from from this tutorial i have just superimposed the azure machine learning sdk on top of the the uh, the baseline uh, 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 cnn uh, lanet over there now uh, lanet is very is one of the uh, you can say was one of the uh, cnn architecture which was originally implemented by the banking sector to uh, to scan the uh, the checks as such and it was proposed by 
and I have it open over here, the Wikipedia, Wikipedia page of this. And it was proposed by Jan Likun uh, as such, and uh, uh, and that's what we are going to deploy. Uh, there are just slight variations uh, from the original architecture paper. Uh, we have reduced the number of uh, neurons in few of the layers. Uh, you can find the original architecture as well, and you can deploy it, it exactly. But it solves the purpose. You'll understand what you are doing. So this is. Uh, I'll just zoom in. This is what we are doing, and we have uh, uh, we have around uh, fifty thousand images for training purpose, and uh, we have uh, ten thousand images for the the testing purpose over there. And I will just quickly see if I can show you the data set as well. OK, so this is the data set we are which we are pulling from here. OK, so CI uh, FAR is basically one. It's a it's a Canadian uh, research uh, agency. You can read about them. So we have uh, 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 sorry, uh, we, we uh, yeah, correct. So these 32 by 32 images, 10 classes are there and uh, around 50,000 training images and 10,000 test images as such. And this is how they will be looking like so out, the output classes are airplane, automobile, bird, class, deer, dog, frog, horse, ship and truck over there. OK, so. Let's go to Azure. OK, now check this out. So I. We'll just zoom in first. So uh, typically uh, you create the Azure machine learning service first, right? So you click on here, you uh, fill up the page, you give the resource group name and all the details and uh, you're able to create the Azure machine learning service. Once the service is deployed, it will be looking something like this over here. See something like that. So I I'll zoom out uh, so I can actually look at the screen first. Uh, I have a very nice uh, architecture of this created, but I have used it in the previous session, so I will not uh, waste your time going through that again, but just to uh, visualize that uh, basically there are data stores where the data really exist in Azure, like storage accounts, data lakes, uh, Postgres, MySQL, uh, and so on and so forth databases. We have the concept of data sets over there, tabular data set, file data set. We have discussed all these things in the previous sessions in more depth. So these are the if you want to create if you want to load data in a pandas data frame you use this if you want to recursively load many files then you use the the file data set so what i have done is i have created this compute cluster today over there and i have the compute instance also this purple thing which you see over here this is the development environment of the data scientist or the person who is doing the data or who's creating the model right now this purple environment we can also use uh, our own laptops and other third party locations as well we just have to install the azure machine learning sdk in that local location and this is the compute cluster where the training will be submitted or where the job will be submitted for the training purpose. Uh, in one of my in one of my upcoming sessions for you guys, we are also going to train in Databricks. So this red red box has been added uh, just thinking that in mind that in future will be uh, deploying. We will be training it in in Spark as well. So ap apart from that, we have the simple uh, we have uh, designer. We you can also monitor when things go wrong using data drift monitor. And we will be creating environment files today. I will show you this part. And uh, uh, and basically we can also deploy this in Kubernetes and so on and so forth, which we are not doing today, but you can definitely go through the previous sessions and this. Uh, uh, and we can also create the MLOps pipelines which are represented here and the session is also coming up. OK, so let's go and see what do we have uh, with us. So I have the Azure Machine Learning Workspace open here. And uh, let's see if we can just make it slightly visible. OK, so this is the Azure Machine Learning Workspace. What I have done is I have uh, basically I have clicked on the compute. I have created this compute instance. This is my development environment. This is the compute cluster. This is where we are submitting the the job for training purpose. Uh, right now it is CPU, but you can also have GPU based clusters over there. Inference clusters are the Kubernetes cluster for the deployment locations. Ta attached target is the one which I was telling telling you uh, Azure Databricks or Azure Synapse, which we'll be using in some upcoming sessions for uh, Spark based uh, distributed uh, ML over there. 
Okay, now after this, uh, basically, if I just take you to the notepad notebooks over there. So what I have done is I have uh, created few of the notebooks here. And uh, I'll walk you through the, these notebooks and uh, you can also do the same thing after the session itself. So the very first thing I would like you to see is the. Uh, let me open the source over there. OK, so model dot So this is the this is the file where we are defining the the LANET architecture. So we are using the uh, NN module is basically we are using the PyTorch NN module. We are inheriting that in the class called as net right now. And we have two functions over there, the init and the forward one. So init initialization over here init is basically uh, so init over here uh, is the one where we will be designing how many layers do we want. So convolutional so you can say uh, convolutional layer, uh, max pooling, convolutional layer, uh, linear and, and so on and so forth. So I'll walk you through these in my uh, diagram which I have created uh, as well. And uh, OK, and in the forward function basically here we have the how the data will be passed through these various layers over there. So if I just walk you through this exact thing uh, over here. Uh, in my diagram, I can just go to the right side and zoom in over there. So the input image is going to be 32 by 32 and we are going with the three channels that it's a it's basically a RGB uh, image will be there and then the input filters. Uh, we have five cross five filters and six filters are being uh, being used right now. So this is what we have defined over here that uh, the three channels are there. The input, the output is having how many filters and then the, the filter size over there. So the kernel size five cross five and because of that the output will will uh, the output which comes out to be will be will be reduced in the size and we will have six of the feature maps and the size will be 28 by 28. So this 28 by 28 is the one on top of which we are doing the the max pooling over there and uh, if I can just move it around or not. OK, I didn't realize that it's not going to move around with with that. OK, now check this out. So basically the max pooling which we are doing over here uh, is basically going to just uh, reduce the size by half over there. So we'll have six uh, feature maps and 14 by 14 uh, will be the 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 output size of it. So that is basically which, which it will happen somewhere in this in this over there. And then the output of that is where we are uh, which we are passing through the next convolutional uh, layer over there. So the input feature map is going to be six and then 16 filters and five is the five cross five will be the kernel size. That is something which will happen over here. So 16 into five cross five over there. So more features are getting extracted uh, more. You can say more details are being extracted from the input. Then again max pooling is done on top of it and uh, this max pooling uh, turns out to be uh, will will convert the output uh, sh will shrink the output to 16 into uh, 16 into 5 cross 5. Now this uh, we, have, we are what we are doing is we are implementing the the LANET original architecture uh, as such. So. Uh, so there are we have, so there are some things which more can be done over here. We can do padding as such. We can do many more things and I think we'll take those things in maybe maybe in any upcoming session over there. OK, one mistake which I can see right now in my diagram is that this is supposed to be uh, 84, not 64, I think. So I'll just correct it. OK, so now OK, so if I just take you back, uh, this this is the uh, so we have you have the, these fully connected layers over here. And if you can see that those are represented right now by these uh, purple boxes right now over here. So 120, 120 uh, units over there. And then we have these 84 will be the will be in the next one, uh, the output of it. And then the final 10 classes are there. So that's why we have the these 10 neurons in the final output class where they are equal to airplane, uh, automobiles, bird, cat, deer, dog, frog, and so on and so forth. So this is what we have done over here and this is basically how we are. Uh, forward basically means like how the data will pass through it. Now uh, OK, I just want to show you a couple of more interesting things over there. Now we are not training this model locally in the compute instance or in my laptop and so on and so forth. What we want to do is we would, would like to remote submit this particular. Uh, model uh, the, the the training should be done remotely in the remote compute cluster. So there are a couple of things which you should be aware of. Uh, 
uh, as such. I think I may have to finally pick up my whiteboard and start drawing something. So the OK, so this is this is the uh, remote cluster. We wanted to train on that remote cluster right now. Over there and we are in the compute instance right now, which is equal to the development environment over here or your laptop and so on and so forth. So uh, and as part of the Azure machine learning services, there is one thing called as experiment. So whatever you do has to be uh, logged inside the experiment or the umbrella where everything is is uh, you can say. Is logged is the experiment as such, so we have to. So what we have to do is we have to start the experiment or we have to create the experiment. Now once the experiment has been created, this experiment will start the run over there. Run is equal to one run like literally run when you submit something it runs. So one run will get created. Now this run ID is the one which we want to pull over there. So this run ID is the one where the logging should happen. So we have to get it and then the logging should happen in that particular run over there. So that is what we are doing over here is. Uh, this is like right now we are in the intermediate uh, part of the execution, but uh, if you can see this is run dot get context. So this is this part where I'm moving my cursor right now where the run ID will be will be will be received. And then finally all this execution is happening inside the the compute cluster uh, over there. Uh, and definitely we could have even um, perfected it further, but uh, this is what I have right now. And if you're aware of PyTorch uh, in the last session, we were discussing about data sets and data loaders. So data sets are the ones which have your data. They are the ones which are holding your sample data and the labels as such. And data loaders are, are the ones which wrap the, the data sets in the iterators and then you pull the uh, and then you can get the batches out of it. So these two things are coming from the PyTorch. Uh, PyTorch uh, data handling modules as such. Now we are initializing the the net uh, which we have created. Uh, the there is a, a loss function over here. We are also optimizing the the network over there. And if I just show you a couple of interesting things, uh, so PyTorch basically, if you remember, we were talking about this that PyTorch is basically going to add up the gradients. So if you are working on the reinforcement learning problem statement, then that it's perfect for you. But for other things, you have to put the zero grad. So uh, in during a back propagation, the the gradients don't get added up over there. Now here we have the backward step and the the optimization is going on over here. And uh, okay, so. This is the this is the file which is going to execute in the compute uh, cluster over there. So here like this, this is the file which is getting executed there. So how do you execute it? Like how do you initiate the run? Right? How do you submit the run? So for that I have basically done two things. Uh, first thing is I have this environment here. See. If it opens up, OK, PyTorch environment and we are going to we are going for Py, uh, Python 3.6 PyTorch torch vision and so on and so forth. So this environment is the one which uh, which will be uh, in which it will execute sort of right over there. Now you have the capability of even initializing the Docker image and keeping it ready right now. What happens whenever I will run it in the, the Docker, uh, the image creation will happen on the way, so it will take some extra time. But if I know that I have to run it again and again, then I can create the Docker image ready and I can just pull the build environment, the build uh, image itself during my run process. So it, it will have all the environments. It will have all the dependencies and the time will be reduced over there. So this uh, OK, so this is what that environment file uh, over here, which will help us in creating that. Now one thing which you can also do is you can uh, basically save it as well. So if I show you some of the others, uh, others which I have saved earlier, you see this custom environments over here. So PyTorch environment experiments and so on and so forth. So these environments can be saved and you can use them later on and it will show something like this over here like that. So. And this is what I was talking about. The build operation can be done from here and from the command line itself or from the notebook itself. So let's go back. And. Uh, OK, so all the dependencies are are, are being uh, are defined and let's find the the run uh, run part as well. So this is how we are initializing or submitting the the run over there. So if we zoom in into this uh, and uh, look at this, so this is the this is the part which we are executing from the remote location from here from from this. So you initialize it from your compute uh, from your development environment of whatever that environment might be. It might be uh, 
compute instance in AML. It might be your laptop. It might be some machine in AWS or whatever it can be. It can be somewhere in the world. So from there you have to initialize it. So you have to run something like this. Now a uh, couple of things. Uh, if you are using your laptop and so on and so forth, you need to need you need to have some information about the the workspace like uh, the the resource group name, the the name of your, the ID of your subscription, the the name of your AML workspace. So there is a configuration file which you can find from. Uh, the previous tab you can go back to the, the resource group click on uh, the machine learning workspace from here like this and you can get the configuration file from there now you can keep this configuration file in the same uh, uh, directory otherwise if you want to hard code it you can also hard code it over here you can specify a subscription id resource group name and so on and so forth you can hard code as well so think it through what you want to do uh, do you want to hard code in the code or not now this is where we are creating the experiment so experiment is the one where everything will happen in, inside this it will get logged over there now uh, we are basically specifying that okay the SRC is the one where we have all the all the information right now. This is the name of my directory where everything is uh, there and uh, the train.py is my file which I would like to submit during my training part. So what happens it will get uploaded into the into the cluster right now. So it is so when, when I specify it like this and when I specify like that. So it's this this file is literally going to be uploaded inside the cluster literally like that and then which which cluster my CPU cluster. CPU cluster has been created. Uh, I think I did it manually maybe or maybe I did it uh, from uh, in a, another notebook. I'm not sure, but this is the one. You can make it anywhere around. So this cluster is going to be having some sort of auto scale settings and based on your uh, utilization, it will scale up, scale out and sc scale in as such. So if I take you back, uh, so this is the remote cluster which we are using. And uh, when in future, if we do the deployment on uh, uh, Databricks, then there will be slight variation and this will be Databricks over there. OK, so which environment are we? OK, it's not scrolling, so I will just zoom out and see if it can scroll. OK, so uh, environment is the same environment file which we which I just showed you and uh, uh, and we, are, we have submitted the run over here. So this basically will create the run and once it creates that the the run ID will be there. So if I click on the experiments, one of them should be the one which I have created, maybe this one, and uh, it will be having few few runs over there. So like this, so display name of the run and the run IDs will be there. So all the all the information about your model, which has been uh, which was which was trained right now, will be there. Matrices will be there, so you can see all the 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 loss is coming down, and images child runs. Uh, any output which happened, any error which may happen, all those things will be here. And uh, this is pretty interesting over here. Explanations uh, like if you have, uh, if you want to understand how your model is behaving, so there is a concept called as local feature importance and global feature importance. So those things are over here. Fairness means basically that if your model is not is biased towards some particular class, or maybe your data was was in in a manner biased towards particular segment of the society or something, then you can understand that and you can modify that you can tweak it. So tweaking it literally means that you are you're reducing the complexity or you, you're reducing the accuracy of your uh, model, but making it more fair for everyone. That is also possible. Uh, and monitoring is where we can monitor all the details and if something is going wrong or create a data drift monitor from here. Uh, from the data set section over here. So when things go wrong, uh, you will be able to understand that my model is not performing well in production. So those type of things are there. So. Uh, OK, so I'll take you to the I'll take you to your learn module again, and this is what I had for the session, and this is what I will be uh, just showing you that you can also perform whatever I have done over here as as such and even uh, more things over there because we have just seen one of the units over here, but uh, it had a lot of history behind it where the the basics of the tensors were also covered and the the simple dense networks and the the uh, the perceptron the multi layer perceptron was was also covered and and so on and so forth so i'll just uh, open the floor for questions if you have questions please uh, go ahead and ask and uh, let me check if there are any questions in the chat right now OK, there is one question in the chat that uh, we have average and max pooling. Please show some highlights into it. I think you saw the the, the in the slide deck, right? How, how what is the meaning of max pooling and what's the meaning of uh, average pooling in the in the picture over there?
uh, yeah, the session is also recorded. You will find the recording of the session on uh, YouTube. Uh, and the session will, the the recorded link will also be pasted in the on the meetup page itself. So you can find us on both the locations. There is a proper channel on YouTube uh, called as Microsoft Reactor and we are pretty frequent over there. By the way, folks, uh, Mike is enabled just in case if you would like to ask questions. You can unmute yourself and ask question to Shivam. Yeah, this is a question. I'm sorry, this is Hariharan here. This is a question on the the memory required for uh, compute in the convolution part. Um, moving from stages, like there's a calculation from uh, the main pixel to the max pool level. Uh, how much of memory will be resourced in the infra side? Is the RAM specification is needed? We have a minimum configuration to execute this. Minimum configuration. See, uh, bigger the network, more the re resource utilization will be there. There are calculations as well and formulas also where we will be able to get an idea of how much, uh, how many you can say, what's the resource utilization. And then the next thing is what happens if we don't have that much of resource, then we think about the, the parallelization, like data parallelization or model parallelization. So earlier the GPUs were, or the, the CPUs were very, you can say constructive. So model parallel or models were, uh, you can say models were models were not very very big uh, as such, but uh, you can if your models are very big, the size of the model is very big. You may have multiple cores on which you may be training it. So model parallelization, and if your data is very big, then data parallelization. So uh, we have answers or the solutions of it, and calculations uh, definitely formulas are available. Okay, if we go by the camera pixels, like for example, if the video capture have to be happening at uh, say 50 a frame per second, or I don't know, uh, we can range between 30 frame per second, 50 frame per second. Will that directly um, represent uh, uh, the scaling part uh, of the system configuration? Is there is there any way it can be taken care of, uh, irrespective of the camera capture? Now, uh, for example, let's say if you're getting the video as such, now videos are just frames. Now, these, if you are getting more frames, definitely resource utilization will go up. One thing which can be done is uh, don't take all the frames and sort of take a batch of it or maybe normalize it or reduce the number of frames which are coming in. Uh, that's one thing. Otherwise, uh, or maybe there is some, some other method also which maybe we can go through. Hey Shivam, this is screen here. Uh, yes. Shivam, like you know, uh, for example, I have to take a real-time scenario where I have to build a model where I have to uh, remove some inappropriate content for Facebook pages, you know, for example, for nudity or any other inappropriate con uh, contents. How will uh, build a model for those kind of applications or model? Uh, what right. are the limitations? What are the limitations where a Facebook can have? To build this kind of CNN model. So, uh, not sure what Facebook's limitation will be, but let's say if we have to uh, make a model for doing the text moderation or maybe profanity filtering is what you are asking about. So, yeah, for the images, images, yeah, for the images that is available with us, we uh, we can totally do that. I'll share the link in the chat window. So, we have cognitive services which are already uh, where you will be able to even upload your own content and. Uh, provide your own, uh, you can say, a prof a profanity, uh, you can say, uh, values as such, and have a look at it. Cognitive services. We can find whether the videos are uh, having adult content or abusive content or the type of content which is, uh, which may not be suitable for children as such, and. Uh, so I can help you deploy this, work on it, and so on and so forth. And what other problems Facebook may face? Uh, I may not be aware of that. Okay, okay, no worry. 
since we need more uh, images, right? More data for CNN or deep learning uh, models, right? So that's what I was asking where we're able to build a model when we need lots of data. Yeah. So that's what I was asking. How we will be, what are the limitations will be for deploying those kind of models in production? Yeah, no worries. We'll go to this. We have mm -hmm. data labeling capabilities in Azure Machine Learning. So let's say uh, you find, let's say you get the raw raw pictures, but you you get the raw videos and the and the images as such, but they are not labeled as such. So we will be able to create uh, one task in AML, and that task can be taken care by the employees who are inside the company. You can start one challenge that that go and start label the picture, and this challenge can also be ex extended to people outside the company. You may pay them, or you may not pay them, or you may give them some reward in some other way around and you build your data set and once you have your data set you you are you can say you have labeled data set and then which is human verified or which is having uh, uh, you can say better quality data set and then that's one bigger challenge which gets solved and then from that point onwards we can go for how can we find the abusive content over there okay thank you Uh, hi Shivam, this is Balaji here. Uh, maybe this is a very fundamental question like I wanted to ask you. This model that you are building using the uh, the notebook PyTorch uh, code. So is it an object like uh, is it a file or it uh, like how we'll be able to use it with an API service when we are going to use when we have created a model. We wanted to use it in one of the applications that I have then I have to call using API. So I wanted to understand whether this model is a, a, a object or it is a how uh, it is getting uh, like how we are training and then the model is getting uh, generated. OK, so during the model training time. Uh, what we will do once the model has been trained, we will save it. Uh, once we save it, you can go for ONX. Uh, Open Neural Network Exchange is one of the very uh, pretty go to or one of the uh, useful uh, format in which in which the model can be saved. So that saved model will be having all the weights will be frozen. There is nothing moving anymore inside it. So sort of. So now once we have saved it, now the next problem is we have to deploy this in the location from where the API call can be done. So now the the way we practically do it is by containerization of the model. So the environment file which you saw, which I was showing you earlier, that environment file will replace the Docker file. This exact environment file will be used to create the Docker image and inside the image we will put this uh, this model and we also need one more file called as a script uh, uh, score file or the the entry file itself. So that entry file or the score file basically means it will have uh, in it and run over there. So that will load the model in when the Docker container will get created. It will load the model and the data which is coming over the API call. It will do the model dot predict and throw the output back. So the OK once this image is ready. Next problem is we have to deploy this. So deployment targets can be in Azure can be app services can be container instances can be Kubernetes clusters. So once they are deployed uh, then uh, you can say a very baseline or a sort of a normal type of uh, deployment has been done. Then you can think about how to make it high available. How can you have multiple models running parallelly? How can you have maybe load balancers on top of it or you can have some sort of uh, ingress controller on top of it. So many more things can be thought for the thought through. So the minimum thing will be take the model, put this inside the Docker uh, image to make the Docker image. We need the environment file. Uh, we also need the this the score file. Uh, these three things will be there inside it and then deploy it. So that part is not here right now. We didn't do that. OK, thank you. Yeah, I got a fair idea. Right. Okay. OK, so guys, uh, think it through. Any other questions which comes to mind? So kindly share the GitHub link where you have done the uh, some such kind of deep learning project so that we can just see the uh, uh, I will. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, thank you, Shivang. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, right. Thank you. Okay. So let me see if there are more questions in the chat. Okay. You can also find me on LinkedIn, and uh, if you have any follow-up questions, you feel free to ask the questions, and we also will be having another session on. Uh, on the next Saturday itself, and that will be another session on uh, where we are predicting. Uh, we are doing more of uh, data analysis as such for uh, 
one uh, basketball match which is going on. So that's the scenario of the the next session. And then we have many more sessions which are lined up on various different bits and pieces of the or, or, or the you can say cycles of or bits and pieces of the entire MLOps life cycle as well. Uh, so join us with that. We all will also be having uh, we'll be do, doing deployments with GitHub Action. We'll be doing deployments with uh, Azure repository, uh, Azure DevOps uh, using the and the Azure repo and so on and so forth. So join us, find us and. Uh, Let us know if you have more questions. I think we are good Shivam for today. We don't have any more questions and like Shivam said, you'll find him. Uh, I mean, he has already shared his uh, social handle. So yeah, in case if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch with him. And with this, thank you so much Shivam for today's session and thank you all for joining us today. Please do share your feedback about today's session. Also, please feel free to use the learn module link, which is already shared in the chat section. You'll uh, be able to, you know, access that link. And um, of course, I mean, that's an additional uh, resources and you can learn a lot from that link. And uh, please visit our Microsoft Reactor Bengaluru Meetup page for more upcoming session. Thank you all once again and enjoy the rest of your day.